Hi. So today I wanted to talk about toxic language detection. It's a surprisingly hard problem, and what I've done is I've had a look at this Kaggle competition. It's an old competition, and I've been making some machine learning pipelines to see if I can detect bad language on online comments. There's a few unintuitive lessons that I've learned, and I would like to share some of them in this video. In particular, what this data set is about, it's about these online comments, some of which are perfectly normal conversational sentences, but some of these sentences contain language that you typically don't want to have on a public forum. Things like, you suck, you're an idiot. That would be an example of something you wouldn't want to have. And what this data set has is it has multiple types of toxic language use. The example that I just gave would fall under the insult category, but there's also obscenity, threatening language, and identity hate. I'm not comfortable sharing all the examples in this video, but I hope that you understand the type of task that we are about to embark on. To keep things easy, what I'll do is I'll just throw all of these different categories of toxic language into a single bucket. All of these examples I will consider toxic, and what I'm hoping is that I'm able to build a classifier that can separate language that is fine from the language that is toxic. And by the end of this video, I hope to emphasize that this really is a tricky problem. The problem was a lot harder than I thought it would be, but also for a reason that I didn't anticipate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be building a machine learning pipeline. I'll be using scikit-learn for this, but I'll also try to evaluate some pre-trained models as well for featureization. The idea is that I'll have text that's coming in, and then there will be this pre-processing step. One of the things that you can do here is you can use count vectors. This will tokenize the text and then count how often a word is being used in a sentence before passing it on to a model. But I can also use some pre-trained language models. In particular, I'll try out the bipair embeddings, the universal sentence encoder, and I'll also consider an English BERT model. So these are pre-processing steps to go from something text-based to something numeric, which means that I can think about the model that I want to put these features into. And I'll just keep it somewhat simple. I'm going to try out a logistic regression, and I'm going to try out a support vector machine as a classifier. And again, the two classes that I'm going to predict are whether or not the text is fine and whether or not the text is toxic. So I was considering doing this in a big grid search, but I did pause and wonder, well, what are things that I really care about? There are some metrics that I might need to concern myself with. So I started thinking what's nice to track. For this particular problem, I figured it'd be good to keep an eye on the recall and the precision. Now, what recall means is, am I able to retrieve all of the toxic comments? And what precision says is, given that I make a prediction that something is toxic, how often is this statement correct? These two metrics both measure different things, but I think it's valuable for me to keep an eye on both. Another thing I want to keep an eye on is the time it takes to train a model, as well as the time it takes to make a prediction. I can definitely imagine that some of these pre-training steps over here might take a while to run, and being able to quantify that, I think, will be very valuable. So this is the big picture idea of the pipeline. But before actually running this in a giant grid search, there's one trick that we're going to have to pull first, because just throwing this in a grid search is going to yield a bad result already. So what I've got here is the Jupyter Notebook where I'm running all of my code. I'm not showing everything, I'm just showing the important bits. And for now, the most important thing is that we have this data frame that has all of our data. We've got our texts as well as our labels. And because I'm just exploring early on, I'm not doing the entire data set. I'm only having a look at the first 10,000 rows. I'm trying to understand the problem a bit more. So to keep myself nimble and fast, I'm just limiting myself a little bit here because that way training times aren't needlessly long. Also note that I'm using the train test split function from scikit-learn here. And the reason why I'm doing that is so that I can say something about the test set as opposed to just the train set. And 
just to get started, I've written myself a little pipeline down below here. I'm only looking at the count vectorizer for now. And what I'm basically doing here is I'm just looping over the support vector machine as well as a logistic regression. I'm putting that model inside of this pipeline. And then I'm just tracking a couple of metrics. I'm keeping track of the train time. I'm keeping track of the predict time. And I am taking an effort to get this classification report. And you can see the first results here. And just from glancing at this, the results don't seem particularly encouraging. If you look at the toxic label over here, if I use support vector machine, the recall is just terrible. And this recall definitely improves when I use the logistic regression. You can see that the recall here is already a lot better, but it still isn't great. If I would scroll down a bit more though, scikit-learn is actually giving me a pretty good hint that something might be going completely wrong here. In particular, it's saying that there's a convergence warning. And in order to figure out what's going wrong numerically here, it helps to look back at our labels. Let's do a count of how often each label occurs. So roughly speaking, looking at this, it seems that about nine out of 10 texts that we have are just fine, and that about 10% of them are toxic. And that's a class imbalance. There are way more examples of texts that are fine and not as many examples of texts that are toxic. That means that if I want to get a classifier that's 90% accurate, basically the only thing that I need to do is just predict fine all the time. And that's something that both of these models currently are not aware of. But it is something that you can fix. There is this class weight parameter that's attached, and you can set it to balanced. By setting this parameter, you're basically telling the algorithm, well, there's a bit of a class imbalance, so keep that in mind as you're making predictions. An extra thing that I'll be doing for logistic regression is I'll also use a slightly different solver. I've checked the documentation, and it suggested that for this use case, this might be a slightly better solver for the algorithm here. So that means that I'm going to be rerunning this, but it might be good to just take a note of the current numbers. We've got a 3% recall here, and just under 55% recall here. And let's see what happens if we actually run this with the class balance. Okay, so we just reran the whole thing. And it certainly seems that the recall went from 3% to 82, and the recall here went from just under 55 to 70. So one lesson to maybe take out of this, if you're trying to do something like this on your own, is to maybe not worry about running the big grid search immediately from the get-go. By looking at only a small subset in the beginning and trying to understand the problem, I've been able to cause an improvement that a grid search on its own simply would not have discovered. Anyway, I think I understand the problem well enough now to do the big grid search, and what I'll just go ahead and do is I'll increase the number of data points here, and I'll also start looping over some pre-trained language embeddings here. So I've ran the big grid search, and here's some of the results. What you can see in this column is the featureizer that I'm using to go from text to something numeric. And here you can see the machine learning model that follows. I'm also listing the precision as well as the recall for the toxic language. And I've also kept track of the prediction time as well as the train time. Now the table is sorted and I've sorted on this precision column. And an interesting pattern does seem to emerge. The model over here that has the highest precision seems to have a similar recall value as well. About three out of four toxic language examples are retrieved, and about three out of four times when we say that a sentence is toxic, it actually is. One thing that I find particularly interesting is that the second best model for prediction actually doesn't come from a super fancy pre-trained embedding. It's the basic count vectorizer with the basic logistic regression. And comparing the performance numbers here, I would argue it's still relatively impressive that a simple count vector and a simple linear model perform so well. That said, this is a good point in time to pause. We have a nice little summary of some statistics here. 
are we now actually convinced that this is a great choice for a model to put it into production? I mean, part of why you might think no is because these training and test times are through the roof. There's a limit to how many sentences you can handle per second here. But we should also maybe stop to think about the use case. Right now, we've only taken a dataset from Kaggle, which is a fun exercise, but it's not necessarily the same thing as solving an actual problem. It's very hard for me to say when a model is good enough without considering an actual use case. It might very well be that the dataset that Kaggle is hosting isn't necessarily representative of the data that's generated by users on the forum that I am maintaining. So even though these results are pretty interesting, I can't really claim that something is good enough just yet. What I can do, though, is demonstrate a weakness that all of these trained models have. And I want to zoom in on this particular issue because these grid search results are sometimes leading you down the wrong path. And this might be one of these moments. So what I've done is I've taken the best performing model from the grid search that I showed earlier, and I've retrained the whole thing, giving it the big train data set. And what I can try and do now is not judge it quantitatively, but instead judge it qualitatively. Just play with the interface myself to see if what comes out is sensible. So for example, I could give the model the text, hello world. And it makes a prediction. The model is saying that this is a non-toxic text. And in this case, I would be inclined to agree. But let's say now I think about what I did when I was a teenager on a forum. And let's think about some of the language that I would be using. I might be writing down something like, oh man, that's totally badass. And here, the prediction would say that it's toxic. And I can totally understand where this comes from. The word ass is being used here. The word bad is being used here. But what the model currently is failing to understand is that this particular combination of words in this particular context of a sentence is actually more of a compliment than something that I might judge to be toxic. A big part of the confusion here probably has to do with the labeling, which in turn points to this cultural aspect. When I look at the sentence, especially if teenager me is looking at the sentence, I would say, well, this is perfectly fine. This is not cursing, this is giving a compliment. But there may be people who consider this bad taste. But I hope you recognize that it's this cultural aspect that is giving this problem a very tricky dimension. Whether or not something is considered an insult is so culturally dependent that I'm having a little bit of trouble assuming that a general toxicity classifier is able to apply in all cases. And a very unfortunate side effect of this might just be that the forum that has this toxicity detector is going to be excluding all of the teenagers on the platform. And that's an effect that you don't want to have. And note that this effect doesn't just happen with teenagers either. It's also something that's been demonstrated across many subgroups of people. In particular, I might recommend the paper The Risk of Racial Bias in Hate Speech Detection. In this paper, they explore how toxic language detection algorithms are at risk of disproportionately excluding minorities based on a mere difference in cultural background. I think it's also fair to mention that the dataset that I showed you earlier, a few years after it was released as a competition on Kaggle, a new dataset appeared with a new competition. This new competition tries to correct for this cultural phenomenon, where the goal is to detect certain types of toxic language, but to exclude any language that might sound toxic, but isn't given the context that it's in. Detecting toxic language is definitely a hard problem, and I've only scratched the surface here. I think it's very noble to try and investigate algorithms to find toxic language. If you can detect it, you might also be able to prevent it, and that's a good thing. The main lesson, though, that I've learned while doing this exercise is that it is very important to also consider these cultural aspects of language before considering that the model is performing well. Even if the grid search suggests that I can be optimistic, there can still be unintended side effects, and it's important to remain mindful of those.